Um, we have a presentation from Lauren Sleck and Yuriko Furihata on world building by non-humans. Um, Lauren Sleck is a London-based artist who predominantly works in video games, 3D animation, and virtual reality. In his work, he uses computer-generated imagery and interactive software to develop digital environments that he describes as three-dimensional collages of found objects and situations, often set within alternate histories of real places or uncanny versions of the near future. His virtual worlds and films explore the impact of technology on society. Um, Lawrence is gonna be introduced by Yuriko Furihata, who's uh, based here in Montreal. Um, Yuriko writes and teaches on media theory, architecture, and the avant-garde arts at McGill University. She's the author of Cinema of Actuality, Japanese avant-garde filmmaking in the season of image politics, and is currently tracing a trans-Pacific genealogy of artificial weather and atmospheric control. So to my friends who were here for the last panel and uh, were inspired by Heather's mention of atmospheric weaponization, get ready on a bit of a crash, crash course. Um, anyway, Yuriko, take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so as Julia said, I'm not an artist, so I'm here to introduce our main speaker, Lauren Sleck, uh, who I'm excited to um, meet finally. And it's been my dream to uh, introduce his work to my students and uh, the community of academics here in Montreal. And I encourage you to go see his work, Geomancer at SAP, uh, if you have a chance. So what I'm gonna do is to give you a, a little bit of my own perspective as a media scholar. Why am I interested in Lawrence's work and why I think uh, it's, it has a kind of a larger political, historical, and aesthetic relevance to you as practitioners or uh, art lovers or critics or cultural producers. So what I would like to do is to focus on how his work, and it's a little bit intimidating to do this in front of the artist, but how his work uh, uh, problematizes different lineages of thinking about art and technology. And I will get to the weaponization of weather shortly. So uh, two works that I um, interested in particular is a 2016 a video essay called Sign of Futurism. And maybe some of you are familiar with this wonderful uh, work and he can tell you more about it. But uh, it really is a kind of critical embracement of cultural stereotypes associated with China. But to, to put a, a, an interesting spin of thinking about what if the kind of non-human otherness that's often associated with uh, the non-Western subjects can be uh, uh, thought in relationship to something like the non-human agency of artificial intelligence. And I really like that association between the two. Is this echoing too much? Should I? Closer? Closer is better? Okay. Uh, the other work that I love is Geomancer. Again, uh, you can go see it, and I will say a little bit more about it. It's about the uh, uh, weather satellite, artificial intelligence, who comes to consciousness as an artist. So why am I interested in this? Um, I'm interested in a uh, history of geoengineering, and this is where I think the weaponization of the atmosphere comes in. Geoengineering, or the, the human control of the weather and climate, has recently gained a lot of attention from the media, but also from academics, including atmospheric scientists who, like uh, Paul Crutzen, uh, who coined the term the Anthropocene, right? He's saying because we do live in a climate crisis, we need a kind of radical intervention to fix the planet and by let's say making like artificial clouds right by um, seeding the stratosphere and create a blanket to uh, block the sunlight and so forth but what I'm interested in about the uh, history of geoengineering is that how it's implicated with geopolitics of East Asia and how it is also inseparable from the history of computing. And this is a familiar history that some of you know, but maybe you don't know much about the Asian part, and this is the part I also want to share with you. Geoengineering is also real, 
that it is a technology that many of the scientists and engineers are working on, but also it's a very fantastical um, practice, right? Uh, and I have this image, I don't think you can see it, but it's a 1954 magazine, uh, Korea's magazine, that says weather made to order. And in this article, one um, American Navy guy who's retired says, what if we can order weather like any other commodities? Right? And he says, like, then maybe we can have rain only on Wednesdays because no one wants to, I guess, have rain on the weekend, right? So that we can have sunny weekend and the rain only on Wednesdays. Of course, that did not happen, right? We cannot control weather like that yet. And it's because it became weaponized, right? It became a kind of a technology that is akin to atomic bombing, so it had to be banned. It can be used for the civilian purposes, like irrigation, but really it cannot be used so commercially, but also because it's not precise. And this has to do with the kind of precision of uh, computing technology that was developed in 1950s. So the weather forecasting became first computerized in 1950 by a team of scientists, including uh, John von Neumann at the Princeton, who wanted to demonstrate the kind of peacetime application of military technology of digital computer, right? So they wanted to predict the weather using computer, and also by doing so, the US Navy actually that funded the program so they can control it. In other words, the assumption is the precision of prediction can lead to control. So this became kind of operational reality during the Vietnam War in 1960s. By the mid 1960s, US government started weaponizing the atmosphere, using hurricanes and storms. And what they wanted to do during the Vietnam War was to prolong the monsoon season in, in, in Vietnam, to block so that the soldiers on the ground cannot move. Or the so this, uh, to interrupt or disrupt the ground logistics, they wanted to control the weather. And this is where I think what's interesting about uh, Lawrence's work, I'm gonna just get into um, the geomancer, is that it brings this history of computing, the geopolitics of warfare in East Asia, and something like a weather prediction in a really, really refreshing, critical way. And what I like about this work, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, is to, um, to think about weather satellite technology as a kind of, uh, as an artificial intelligence who comes into consciousness as an artist. And this is an artist who's also called geomancer. And in Chinese, it's a feng shui, right? I'm not Chinese, I cannot pronounce it well, but in Japanese it would be who sees you. And I like this, that weather satellite is a feng shui master. What does it mean to say something like artificial intelligence is a feng shui master? Because it complicates, I think, <laughs> the idea of art, right? Something like if the geoengineering is a type of art or technology of creating the artificial weather, what we have here is a different lineage of controlling the weather, right? It's a kind of art, a cosmological understanding of how to create the world and also reorient yourself in relation to the natural environment. So for me, um, Lawrence's work, together with Sinofuturism and something like Azure really pushes us to think about different ways of thinking about art. Art can be um, the sort of typical Western romantic idea of originality, right, production of original work, which is often contrasted um, implicitly with something like copying and making counterfeit. And as Lawrence's work demonstrates that association often gets uh, geographically expanded onto the binary between the East and the West. Clearly his work complicates that. The second, I think what's interesting uh, is that art is often, again, assumed as an expression of interiority, right? Like of the artist. This is a modern um, understanding, but also art can be a set of skills or techniques. And these set of skills or techniques can be associated with uh, engineering, right? Modern engineering. This is why I said geoengineering could be considered to be something like an art. It's a dangerous art, right? It's like an art of warfare. And third, I think there are ways of thinking about art as an embodied techniques uh, of speculation. And that's opposed to something like technological instruments or machineries of prediction, again. And I'm interested in this 
a futurity of speculation, prediction, or something like even divination. Because what it does is a kind of orientation towards the future. And in this sense, I think Lawrence, again, does a wonderful um, work in uh, Sino-Futurism to bring out one of the stereotypes of China uh, as a kind of addiction and gambling. What is gambling, right? What is the logical gambling? When we buy lotteries, what do we do? We believe in the future, right? We believe in the luck. There will be a kind of unpredictable unexpected surprise turn of the event. We believe in, we invest in the future. And I think what it is, is that gambling and something like artificial intelligence don't look like you know, uh, the same thing, right? They look like very different practices, but they are conditioned by the same impulse towards the future, right? We cast our belief in the future like and what we do with artificial intelligence, we use big data. We use the kind of data collected so that our little voice assistant can anticipate what my mood is. <laughs> or like what, you know, like um, the smart air conditioners can anticipate my body temperature and so forth. So there is something about this speculative futurity that are already uh, enabled by the non-human agents and actors. So with that note, I would like to turn the microphone to Lawrence. Thanks. Okay, I'll try not to make this feedback. Is it because I'm too close to that? Anyway, so uh, yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Yuri, for the uh, really nice introduction. I'm gonna basically do a very quick tour going back about four or five years about my practice. And basically, like I have a background in architecture and electronic music, so what I was always interested in is this idea of world building. So, you know, as a musician, it's about like this sonic world building. And I guess as an architect or urban designer, you're trying to create this like physical world that manifests in the future. And I think one thing I took from architecture is this idea that you're always dealing, you know, with the future. You're kind of creating representations through like 3D, 3D models or drawings or kind of urban plans in order to deliver a kind of physical object or a physical environment that is kind of purely based on like trust and myth making until it physically exists. And I guess, um, yeah, about four or five years ago, I started considering what if the kind of virtual phase of that process was actually taken as the main thing as opposed to, you know, this step in the long chain that results into a physical object. And my first series of uh, kind of what I call, you know, site-specific simulations were really based on, I guess, experiences of rail places. So I'm just going to play a short clip of um, one of these called Skyline, which was basically this speculative proposal for like a utopian um, underground subway line that connected all these different places, these underground uh, independent art spaces around London, basically. And the other main point I want to make is that even though it's kind of to do with world building and so on, I always try and render it from this, you know, first person video game point of view so that no matter how um, kind of grand the idea is, it's really about the individual experience of a kind of particular place or location. You probably can't see it. Mm. 
Oh no, you can. Pensig, where do you want to get? Don't you get it? Okay, since you probably can't read the subtitles, the um, what I kind of was doing with these works is basically making kind of like a, I guess, three, four-dimensional collage. So I was taking kind of like real things I knew, like this London tube train, and taking basically various samples, both from the real world and this film in particular. This film is um, it's 2046 by Wong Kar Wai, and basically in 2046, which is a sequel to another one of his films called In the Mood for Love, it's about basically this, I guess, series of journeys and memories and uh, memories of the future. So the main protagonist is basically, uh, he's like a kind of science fiction comic book writer. And in this particular voiceover, he's talking about another place he visited. So, you know, that's really another one of my interests, like this idea of each medium being about, a, like, even if it's a film, it's really talking about another place, basically. Um, and so this, these trailers are basically made from, I, I basically make them with, you know, um, uh, video game software. So this one, and they're made by basically live capturing like a, you know, uh, on a video game controller, a journey through this landscape. Um, and so, yeah, here you can, you can't see, but I'll I illustrate. It's basically this idea that this uh, skyline, this train line is elevated above all the other buildings which London is in at the time and you know there's generally like it's raining and it's flooded to suggest some kind of environmental apocalypse that actually no you know it's kind of treated as if life goes on afterwards basically um and and this i mean this uh voice over here it's um i think from stalker <laughs> Что же резонирует в нас в ответ на приведенный к гармонии шум? So again, that's you know another case of this you know seminal like Tarkovsky science fiction film where even though it's about you know this experience of another place or like wish fulfillment, the the kind of characters within that are talking about music, but music as if it's like this kind of metaphorical stand-in for this the cin cinematic space basically. So in this yeah th this series, what's nice about using the video game engine is that. It, it both makes it cinematic on the one hand and also kind of live in, in the way that I capture it as well. Um, and I'll just show another sample of uh, another one of these more public projects. This one is called, um, uh, this one is called, one sec, uh, Dalston Mon Amour. So basically I was looking at the uh, Alain René film Hiroshima Mon Amour, which is basically set, you know, it's, um, set in this like post-traumatic, post-Second World War, po um, basically occupation of Japan. And in this case, it was for a kind of public art festival in London, in East London. And so I took this like Art Nouveau cinema and imagined an alternate version of Hiroshima Mon Amour being projected in that cinema as if the kind of post-war site was in East London as opposed to in Japan. And what's interesting for this film as well is that um, the the Japanese actor I don't know his name he the, you know he's speaking French to the French actress but it's one of these cases that he's making the sounds of French as if he can communicate with her but he he doesn't speak French he doesn't like understand what the words mean so in this case of you know like cinematic illusion where like actual understanding isn't possible this is kind of what is leading me on to talk about more like non-human ideas of communication, right? So, you know, with things like the Turing test, you can simulate things like understanding, language, and intelligibility for the other person, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you yourself as the person speaking it or the AI speaking it, whatever, actually understands what's going on. Uh, apologies if subtitles aren't working or too low. de penser à ces difficultés que présente le monde quelquefois. Sans ça, il deviendrait tout à fait irrespirable. Elle 
Éloigne-toi de moi. Monsieur, vous n'êtes pas un coup. Non. Il est probable que nous mourrons sans nous être jamais revus. Il est probable, oui. Sauf peut-être un survin. C'est la guerre. So I mean, these these cases which like now, sorry, now I look at them. What's interesting is like in terms of world building, they also form kind of like an archive of the various projects I've done and also the different places. And sometimes I make these kind of like open world video games that actually incorporate all of these different places within the game itself. Um, but also, in, in you know, in terms of sampling, what's really interesting to me is that it's not just, I guess, the sociological or political aspects I'm interested in reflecting, but really, I guess, also just you know the I don't know like cultural experience of like electronic music and also how when you're dealing with these ideas of like futurity and also nostalgia, it operates on two in two ways. You know, like so many songs are really about this kind of like happy, sad, you know, euphoria and dysphoria that comes with the sense of like something that's been lost. Lost. And um, you know this this mood really kind of pervades lots of the different things I do. Um, we don't have that much time, but I also want to show just another the last one, which was really kind of site specific in this way. Before I kind of dealt with ideas of um, of kind of AI and so on, and like different kinds of subjects. So, uh, this one is called Berlin Mirror, and it's really about. Um, uh, was it's for an uh, exhibition at a place called Kunstwerke, and it's in a place in Berlin that used to be on the east side of the wall, basically. And since the you know si since reunification of Germany in 1989, it became this really like you know um, well-known kind of Kunsthalle art gallery kind of space. But in this in this project, I became more interested not in the sense of you know this anonymous narrator but actually creating like fictional artists who would tell the story of each particular place and so uh, again apologies if this isn't legible but there's an american artist dan graham who was born in illinois in 1945 and i imagined what if dan graham in, and he's dealing with you know ideas of like public space and transparency and and you know like people looking at other people and so on. But I thought, what if you took his practice and imagined that he was actually born in Berlin, sorry, in 1942, in, and how the weight of history would have transpired differently in his practice. Um, and so I'll just play a few, um, a few mo 
minutes of this, in which basically is the first time I created like a fictional artist who was kind of expressing what I observed about each particular place. Ich wollte immer eine Künstlerin sein. Aber ich habe Dinge gesehen, die sie sich nicht vorstellen können. Wendepanzer in der Aurusstraße. Das Leuchten der Flakfeuer am Brandenburger Tor. All diese Momente werden mit der Zeit verloren gehen. Die Echos im Sturm. Die Geschichte war schwer, also musste meine Kunst leicht sein. Seit über 60 Jahren arbeite ich mit dem Motiv des Monuments und der Ästhetik virtueller Realität. Es ist meine Art, die Gegenwart wieder zu beleben. Als ich für eine Retrospektive zu Berlin Biennale 2042 eingeladen wurde, wollte ich etwas Besonderes machen. In der Ausstellung Berliner Spiegel bringt alles zusammen, was ich bisher an meinen Arbeiten untersucht habe. Transparenz, Oberflächen, Reflexion und Erinnerung. Geschichte von Berlin, von meinem Leben, von unserem Leben. Ich wurde 1942 gegenüber der heutigen KW geboren. Mein Vater hat in der Marine verkauft. This kind of sorry in this kind of um, narrative, I was trying to like wrap up this I idea of the identity of the city and the identity of the in individual as if both are really intertwined with each other. Um, and you know, in this in this particular case, like the idea of history and how to deal with it, I kind of did that by projecting in the future in you know 2042 and imagine imagining that this fictional sculptor was having a hundredth birthday retrospective in this particular institution. And so, you know, the other thing is without any kind of limitations to, you know, kind of like artist production budget or so on, what would their project be? Or like what would actual Dan Graham's project be in this case? And so their virtual installation in this video game was basically this um, kind of massive mirror that, that was angled for kind of 45 degrees in the middle of this institution's courtyard so that as you looked up and it, when it was raining on it, you would see the reflection of the Berlin Dome, which is the uh, Berlin Cathedral, like projected back into it. So that, you know, there's this idea that, you know, again, as an architect, I'd always think like, oh, what if you could create any ideal building or structure? And I'd always look at, you know, like land art or different uh, ideas of, I guess, like monumental sculpture as, paradigms in, you know, like what a kind of creative practice would be. Um, and then so in, in this building, within the building, I kind of interspersed different fragments. So in this video room, which is also another exhibition space in the gallery, I put in like archival footage of basically um, Berlin just after, uh, after the kind of allies and Soviets occupied it. Um, and then after this, I felt I kind of came to the end point in, in a certain way of production which was more about you know being really site specific in terms of every video every film that I was doing and basically I got a grant to do uh, to make a new film and I was thinking you know what should I make um, and I decided to actually set it in Singapore where my family now lives and Singapore is quite often seen as this um, kind of prototype neoliberal dream state you know like really because uh, it was independent in 1965 um, from Malaysia, and before that, it became independent from the UK in 1957. So I was trying to reflect on the independence of this uh, particular city-state and with the independence of the individual, but also projecting into the future in 2065, which would be the centennial of the um, country's independence, basically. And for this, the as as Yuri introduced, my kind of the main uh, protagonist or like character for the film was Geomancer, who is this weather satellite created um, in Singapore. And so there's this you know parallel between the individual search for autonomy on the one hand and the kind of nation states uh, independence on the other hand as well. Um, I'm just going to play a trailer for that um, quite quickly, so you get the sense of what that's about, um, which is 
also the first time I think in a while that I'd made the the soundtrack as well. So again, in in current studies with artificial intelligence and deep learning in artistic processes, there's you know using it for kind of sound generation and video generation and moving image generation. So in this case, I used a I used a specific kind of deep learning program called the Neural Network Autoencoder to create a dream sequence towards the end of the film, which isn't actually in here. And for the um, for the soundtrack, I basically made it myself and with a kind of Vocaloid, which is, um, as some of you know, it's kind of like a, um, a voice synthesizer by Yamaha. Oh. Lo 如果我有手，我会是雕塑家；如果我有声音，我会歌唱；如果我有灵魂，我会祈祷。但是我只有心灵的眼睛，所以我梦想世界。so um, again, my particular choice in having this weather satellite as a protagonist is two things. I think first there's, I guess, the psychological narrative that I was thinking about in terms of portrayals of AI, because of course, you know, generally in, in films or in science fiction, there's really this binary opposition between the human and machine, and then the fears of like things like, you know, killer robots, robot takeover, or this um, liberation narrative dominate the kind of way that um, AI and humanity is kind of portrayed in films. Um, and so I thought by having essentially the um, the kind of satellite come down to Earth, that's one mechanism of, of basically, even in narrative terms, ma moving the plot forward, but also changing from this, you know, how should I say, this um, overarching way of consciousness, like literally objectifying the Earth, looking down from above, and actually really descending onto it as being something I guess, metaphorically, about engaging with the world that they're in. Um, and as, as, as Yuri said as well, it's also this idea of super intelligence or this idea of like the technological sublime. Like how would a consciousness capable of processing so much information actually come to terms with the idea of creativity itself? Um, in terms of, you know, is it just copying? Where does the line between originality and generating, let's say, original material or content come, in, uh, come into it? Um, and during the um, during the research for this particular particular film, I kind of um, started observing a couple of things, which really like led to this video essay called Sino Futurism. And basically, I, I recognize again being very familiar, like living in London and um, growing up in uh, Southeast Asia, these kind of parallels between portrayals of, I guess, artificial intelligence and uh, basically orientalist fantasies of East Asia, um, which could either be seen from, a, I guess, a post-colonial viewpoint on the one hand, as a very kind of like nationalist viewpoint or the other about, you know, kind of um, cultural domination or superiority. And basically, the insight that I got is that discussions about artificial intelligence and automation and robotics are really like in, uh, very much a mirror image of how I guess, Chinese technological industrialization is unfolding. And this was made in 2016, so that's, you know, three years before this One Belt, One Road initiative, three years before this, you know, Huawei 5G scandal and all this kind of things. But basically what I realized is that really these two things are mirror images of each other, right? The, the, the fear of loss of jobs, loss of productivity, uh, loss of employment, loss of, I guess, global domination or whatever you want to call it, 
it's really the same whether people, you know, like whether Fox News or whatever was talking about um, uh, artificial intelligence or whether they were just talking about Chinese industrialization. And so I was talking to my friend um, uh, who I work with sometimes, Steve Goodman, uh, Code 9, who also, you know, is like a media theorist and writes about um, the basically virality of different cultures, amongst other things, about why is it, and I was really searching, like, Chinese futurism. I was asking him, like, why is there this black hole where there's so much popular discussion about this topic, either from this, you know, like, business business airport book kind of thing, like, you know, the dragon rises, China dominates the world in a positivistic sense, and also in a terms of, like, a kind of fear-mongering info wars kind of sense. Like, why isn't there any critical discussion about these things in a slightly playful and subversive way as there is with definitely, you know, like Afrofuturism and Gulf Futurism on the other hand. Um, because when I was searching for it, it's just there was a real void about it. It's slightly different now, of course, but the reason I made this video essay was really more just to like to fill a void, basically. Um, and so the video essay kind of deals with seven key, I guess, cultural stereotypes, I guess, which are also very true with, I guess, both deep learning research in AI and Chinese cultural reproduction, essentially. So you have copying, gaming, gambling, computing, labor, uh, and addiction, basically, and another one I forget. Um, and really, these two things are mirror images of each other. I could, for example, you know, deep learning algorithms are very good at copying, right? Which is exactly the same thing that, you know, um, is said about kind of Chinese technology companies, right? Like very good at modeling or emulating or taking apart um, better designed devices, but where does the originality come in? Or things like, you know, um, this idea of, let's say if you see a Foxconn factory work as being this like hive mind of uh, dehumanized robots versus, you know, AI robots, which are actual robots. So there's just these massive parallels between them. And one of the insights that, you know, I was talking with Steve about was the fact that, like, for example, with, um, with uh, if the, essentially, like, the, to hugely uh, simplify, if the Afrofuturist narrative or the problem with that is, like, non-ownership of the body, one way of getting over that is not to appeal to, like, humanist liberation or, like, humanitarian ethics basically and saying like treat us like humans because we are human instead of doing that it would essentially like take the projection of um of inhumanism basically and actually uh, exaggerate it to such an extent that not only are they not human but they're f furthermore they're alien or from outer space so i thought that the uh the equivalent for Sinofuturism would be not so much the alien, but the AI. So for example, if portrayals of the Chinese workforce in industrialization are already dehumanized, you know, made to act like robots who are like work 24 seven for no money and are really good at copying and, and all of these things and also slave to addiction, actually embrace that as, uh, as emblematic of the Sinofuturist avatar, which is the AI essentially. So that's really what the, um, this video essay is about. It's not so much any kind of like um, uh, ethnographic perspective because the other thing with Sinofuturism in particular is that the products of technology, it's already like this globally dispersed system that is really enmeshed within um, technological culture throughout the world. And that is part of the problem if we can even see now with basically getting things like Huawei out of out of the ecosystem, you know, it's so enmeshed in so many different things and, and products and processes, both software and hardware, that part of my point with, um, I guess, Sinofuturism, it's not about ethno-nationalism, but it's really about this entangled global condition that, that is faced there. Um, but of course, my interest is never really to be particularly didactic about a situation or anything like that. So in another video game work called 2065, which is probably uh, invisible here as well, um, which is a video game work bringing together the virtual worlds of Geomance and some of the other ones, I basically, how should I say, I tried to create, so I'm also conscious now that, for example, works that I put online, works like Sinofuse Futurism or works like Geomancer, will be watched by a non-human audience, whether that's a YouTube algorithm or a future kind of, you know, like 
uh, Spotify AI for the soundtrack um, or a Netflix recommendation algorithm. So I'm conscious that the work I'm making now is also for a future non-human audience. And so being conscious of this makes me like write this into the narrative in a, in a very like real sense as well. So in this video game, which is called 2065, um, basically, I imagine a world in 2065 where a future group of AIs has seen Sinofuturism and because and has basically treated it like a manifesto for their actions. So, in a way, um, kind of like previously with works to do with virtual reality and so on, I'm kind of like predicting my own obsolescence or death as an author basically and in this and in this case it's really about taking that to the next level where i've written that in into the work so i'll just play a, a brief part from this and then get back to the stuff if it's visible In 2065, The streets are empty. Nobody travels anymore because the, re uh, the virtual is more real than reality. With all work taken care of by algorithms, people spend all day playing online video games against AIs. They don't even have to cheat because the AIs always let humans win. Um, but basically, to summarize, this the scenario is like, what automation and AI has brought is not even just like environmental catastrophe and loss of jobs. It's also created a kind of entertainment culture that is all embracing. So essentially it's you know another version of this um, universal basic income post-work society in which you know like people no longer have to work because the robots do all the manual labor and the algorithms do all the knowledge work. Um, but these I guess these narratives are really wrapped in with the both the uh, scenography of the world and their kind of uh, the narrative within it as well. So I've kind of brought in not just the the subject matter or not just the manifesto aspect of Sinofuturism, but also the um, the media in which they're engaging with. Like so, for example, gambling and gaming and so on are all really integrated into the fabric of the world itself. Um, this is a not that you can see. This is. Um, this is a scene from Geomancer, or rather the kind of virtual setting of Geomancer, which is set in Marina, Marina Bay Casino in Singapore, with, where, um, where really it's this, you know, like heart of gambling within this, you know, ne neoliberal entertainment economy. And I guess the final point I want to make for AI is, I guess, like this psychological thought experiment to do, that Yuri mentioned a little bit earlier, is that if your consciousness is dominated by total knowledge and super intelligence and kind of rapid thinking and predictive and predictivity basically then the most inaccessible thing would be this idea of you know chance or luck or having a system like roulette or something that is purely non-computational um, and so what's the line between you know what can be uh, basically what can be predicted in terms of futurity and what like maintains uh, you know this kind of Con what helps you maintain control of the environment as well. Um, and I think I might, actually, do you want to see another trailer? Do you want to see another trailer? Okay, so the, so wh while um, Geomancer dealt with kind of computer vision and the idea of, uh, I guess, algorithmic intelligence in terms of image processing, I wanted to, the, the film I did after that, which I finished in uh, April this year, is called um, Idol, basically, and it looks about music as this, um, not just as a cultural product, but really as, how should I say, as this field where the, the logic of distribution, streaming platforms, MP3s, and so on, really changes the way in which music is composed. And so the plot basically goes at like, uh, 
it's it surrounds this um, kind of like Super Bowl Olympics, except it's not American football, it's uh, it's eSports. So for the halftime celebration of that, this uh, kind of fading superstar wants to make a comeback. And in doing that, she enlists the help of an AI songwriter to help her write the song that she's going to perform at, at the um, at the eSports Olympics. So it's about a few things. One is, I guess, still about like algorithmic creativity, and it's about <clears throat> the experience of music and the industrial process of it. But it's really, again, I kind of wanted to make a movie, basically. So that's what it is. Um, one sec. Then after that, any questions or whatever? <laughs> 当心你的粉丝，Diva。有一天，他们需要你。接着，他们会删除你。还有些时间完成这首歌。难道你不想永远活着吗？永垂不朽，我不想。这不是困扰我的问题。我们的世界。已经由外转向里，机器学习只导致了通用的规则。这是人工智能的真正遗产吗？在没有建筑师的情况下生成建筑，没有音乐家的音乐，没有影响者的影响。在四十年代的时候，Temple真的很活跃。我每晚都去，我在那儿遇到了所有的明星、制片人和设计师，这是我全部的生命。Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, do you guys have questions? Questions. Questions. I know Yuri has a question to kick us off. So while you guys think of some questions, I guess Lawrence, you already um, answered many of my questions, but maybe you can uh, say a bit more. About uh, you told me yesterday uh, that you're interested in artificial intelligence to light. Uh, so it's not just uh, the kind of creativity, but there's also some darker side of artificial intelligence becoming conscious or having something like a consciousness. Yeah, sure. I, I was talking to you yesterday about the idea of. Um, so I mean, so obviously people ask me like what my kind of political or ethic ethical position, I guess, is in relation to that. Um, and I guess I don't really have a kind of clearly defined one at the moment, because as AI is both the subject and sometimes the protagonist of my work, I'm more interested in kind of creating narratives where it's not as simple as a kind of binary opposition between both, for example. So in in this film, like you might see some things that, you know, like Farsight presents this, or in the in the previous one, there's like this logo of Farsight. So Farsight is my kind of fictional Google-like corporation within the films that has created these AIs as well. Um, but I've also last year made it into my just basically like video production company as well. So, but in order to in a strange way, be able to like understand both sides or motivations to do with technology. You know, actually, as um, Johnny was saying with with his own work, you know, we are as creators like dependent on these mechanisms that we use to make our work. And at what stage do you also get to kind of critique it as well? So, in terms of AI rights and responsibility, I think the most interesting thing is kind of like positions 
taken by, I guess, someone even someone like Alan Turing, who is saying something like, you know, when he was first kind of conceiving of the idea of, you know, the kind of Turing test in these machines, he's, he was like, what if we don't consider the AI like a kind of fully fledged intelligence, but it's really this child AI, right? It's this child AI that you that is learning all the time and through this process of learning can emerge at some kind of like, I guess, more mature consciousness. But just like, you know, children cannot be convicted of crimes, you, how can you ascribe responsibility for a system that is so immature but has so much kind of potential without the experience of kind of ethical decisions or certain decision making process or morality that that you know humans are much more conditioned to do through being socialized in in order to do that so that's kind of my my take on it so in in these cases like in geomancer for example the ai it's you know it's like a you know it's like a emo teenager who doesn't really know what to do as opposed to like a kind of sinister um, a sinister kind of police state slave, essentially, which is quite often the case. Yeah. Any final questions? All right. Um, do check out some of Lawrence's videos online. I know it was a bit hard to see in this room here, but um, you can find a bunch of these trailers and the sign of futurism video in its full version on his Vimeo page. And um, it's a really fascinating world to investigate when you have a chance. Um, thank you again, Lawrence and Yuri for your presentations. Thank you.